This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Pensacola's starring role in the making of the state of Florida on this edition of In Studio. Florida's first place city played a crucial role in the Sunshine State becoming what it is today. Two centuries ago, Andrew Jackson came to Pensacola to raise the American flag and transfer West Florida from Spanish control. Thus began the process of setting up a new government. Florida became a U.S. territory and Escambia became one of its two original counties. On this edition of In Studio, we'll learn the details of what happened and how it ultimately affected the state of Florida and all of us. In the first half hour, we are joined by two experienced archeologists who have extensively studied the history of West Florida. Dr. Judy Benz is an historical archeologist specializing in the Spanish colonial archeology span of West Florida between the years of 1698 and 1763. She is the emeritus president of the University of West Florida and a professor of archeology. span Margot Stringfield is an archeologist at UWF. Now, much of her research focuses on historic cemetery preservation and conservation, as well as Pensacola's colonial British, Second Spanish, and early American periods. We want to welcome both of you to the program. Mm, thank you. Thank this you. This is, we're so glad you're here, and this is really, really exciting stuff. Um, let's start out by um, introducing what we're doing and why. I understand you were contacted by the mayor and also by Escambia County to do something really significant. True, uh, right after uh, Grover Robinson was elected mayor of uh, Pensacola, uh, we belong to the same civic organizations and after one of our lunches, he, he cornered me and said, you know, he, he would like me to head up a historical something. <laughs> and uh, I said, uh, well, sure, Grover, I'll, I'll, I'd be happy to. And the first thing that, uh, that occurred is uh, this uh, bicentennial celebration of becoming a, a U.S. territory. And we've kept him briefed. And then, of course, the county comes on board, and they both gave us some funding. Uh, $25,000 each, and then the legislative delegation to Tallahassee got on board, and they matched our local. And so uh, it uh, it started with uh, Mayor Robinson, and uh, uh, I just uh, gave uh, one of our groups an update yesterday, and he was very happy. I'll bet he was. And then you knew to contact Margo and oh, get heavens, her involved, yes. too, oh. right? Uh, begging is a better word, but uh, Margot is very experienced. Mm -hmm. We work together on many projects, and uh, we are have different strengths, different talents, and uh, I, I knew that this would be too much for just me, and Margot is really good at getting people in the right place, doing the right thing. You've been very busy, and um, I know everybody appreciates that very much. Well, I think one thing about this uh, project is it's something that everyone um, can embrace. We are all Floridians, and this is a commemoration of how we came to be Floridians. Um, if um, things had not changed, we would still be Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at some point, we probably would have been um, absorbed into the United States, but in 1821, uh, we see um, the actual culmination of um, actions to bring us into the United States. And so being able to look at us and our role uh, not only as Floridians, but as Americans, um, has been a really fulfilling uh, endeavor with this project because it has involved so many people from different um, areas uh, of our um, community, uh, different ethnicities. Um, it, this, this is a people-to-people -people project, and one of our first um, 
topics that we talked about was the fact that we wanted everyone to be invested in this. Everyone should have a, a really tie in to what is going on because everyone led to what we have today. Everyone in our past and everyone living today is also part of the history that is to come. So this is a real buy in to uh, who we are as uh, Floridians and as Americans. We, we were um, talking about how we really truly are quite a melting pot here. Florida was a lot of things uh, before it became part of the United States. Oh, heavens, it was a colony for over 300 years of Spain. The French had us for three years, uh, the British had us for 18. And, uh, but overall, we were a colony of a European nation uh, for actually 308 years, longer than we've been part of the United States. And uh, so it is uh, an interesting perspective, and it was a huge change, not just a political change. It was a cultural change. Uh, the descriptions of Second Spanish, uh, late Spanish Pensacola, and let's say 50 years later, very different groups of people, uh, of course, a form of government, and everybody spoke English by that time. Mm -hmm. They didn't at the transition. Well, so we really are diverse. And I think one of the things I've heard you talking about is that, of sure, the headline was that Andrew Jackson came to town and did this, but it was the people. Is that right? Well, it was the people. Now, certainly, Andrew Jackson was a moving force. And, uh, but uh, he, he did not come into a void. Uh, he came into a vibrant uh, community. That's a good way to put it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, and uh, so there was a lot going on here, and and I think you know if we look at it today, uh, we we look at our community as a whole. We don't look at it as uh, just one, two, three, five, ten people um, that are uh, our, our our leadership roles, and those are very important roles. We look at everybody and what they bring to the table and how they add to uh, who we are. So as part of this commemoration, you have a lot of people working behind the scenes. How did you put together the group of people? Well, we talked about this as I was, uh, after Margot agreed to help and be co-chair, uh, the key word is diversity. What Spanish Florida had was a, a big Spanish population, lots of French people from Mobile and New Orleans came over. France and Spain were allies most of the time, not all the time. And uh, there were Native Americans here, alive and well. There were Africans, either enslaved, enslaved or free. Uh, and there were uh, uh, people from many diverse uh, uh, countries. And so diversity kind of is our sort of our uh, uh, theme, if you will. And so we thought, well, we need on this commission to have represent representatives of all the diverse ethnic groups that were present at the time of uh, the transition. And so uh, we're Hispanic, uh, and that uh, uh, the, uh, the Native American, African Americans, and so on, and uh, Anglo-Saxons, of course. Uh, but it, that is really what we did. And we have 13 members, and they represent, there's one or more representatives of all the groups, ethnic groups that were here. And also, we have some scholars. We have real historians. We have real archaeologists. And we, all, we had, unfortunately, we had John Appleyard, who was kind of a local folk historian, and we miss him greatly. Uh, but uh, that, that was the kind of the organizing theme that we had. And uh, another thing is that in the, we celebrated, that Pensacola celebrated the territorial 150th anniversary back in 1971. And at that time, historians and archaeologists uh, were of the big man theory. We looked at history, Napoleon and the mm -hmm. kings and the queens and, and, of course, Andrew Jackson. Uh, things have changed. And uh, Andrew Jackson, like Margot said, is absolutely an important part. But there were other important parts, too. And we wanted to be much more inclusive uh, in the modern view and appreciation of history yep. and our current culture. Everything that's going on, it's, it's just wonderful. And as part of this, you're putting together quite a few products. I mean, you're doing this right. Well, like I said, we, we have some funding and we're using it. Uh, for example, 
uh, uh, we have an article. Uh, the Florida Humanities puts out a magazine uh, periodically, and the June issue is devoted to our celebration of the Territorial Bicentennial. Uh, in, uh, in the magazine, I just looked at some proofs today, mm -hmm. and it's beautiful. We kind of have short-term products and long-lasting products, and uh, uh, that's one of them. Another one, yeah, people probably uh, have been aware that we arrange, Margot and I, Margot really has done the heavy lifting <laughs> on this, the News Journal, articles in the News Journal every week for 23 weeks or more, and getting people to write you know, within the parameters and on time, and it's, you know, their deadlines are real. <laughs> uh, at any rate, uh, those are going to come out in two issues um, done by the Florida Trust of the Pensacola H uh, History Illustrated. So there will be a hard copy version, and we've, we've spruced them up with more illustrations and some further readings that they can have. So those are the kind of products that we want to last behind this, and uh, also the... Uh, the fun celebration of uh, on the actual day is going to be so great. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that, Marga. That um, well, um, we had we we were we, we were very pleased to think that we're going to be able to do this uh, in public, and I think people are so looking forward to being out and um, and having something that uh, is nothing but celebratory and uh, catches catches everyone's eye. So that day um, there will be a, a, a blessing at dawn by the Santa Rosa Creek tribe and uh, everyone is invited to that. That will be a, a privilege for us to be invited to that and there will be no filming or recording in any way. We will be participating in an intimate ceremony. And uh, then, of course, after that, we encourage everyone to go eat breakfast. Andrew Jackson certainly did. <laughs> uh, go eat breakfast. Uh, and at 10 o'clock, then we will all gather in Museum Plaza in historic Pensacola Village. And from there, uh, we will have uh, music, the music they were playing in 1821. Uh, UWF bands are providing that. Uh, we have honor guards uh, from um, the United States Navy that will be participating. Uh, we, of course, will have, have some speakers uh, that will um, address the audience. Uh, we also have, um, at that time, uh, mariachi bands uh, strolling through the village. Uh, Historic Pensacola Village will be open that day at no charge, uh, and so you'll be able to visit all of the facilities within the Historic Village. You will be walking on Colonial Pensacola yes. and early Territorial Pensacola. Um, the uh, Pensacola Archaeological Society, along with the Archaeology Institute, will be uh, talking about what the the uh, archaeology is there in the plaza and uh, about what we do downtown and uh, how we bring what's underground uh, to the public um, so that they understand the many layers of uh, Pensacola's history and archaeology. Um, there will also be uh, dancers. We are going to have Hispanic dancers. Um, we, uh, we come out of Spanish tradition, and that tradition today is, has a slight twist to it, and you'll be reading in the newspaper uh, in our up, one of our upcoming articles uh, about the modern Hispanic community in Pensacola mm -hmm. as it related to the, the Spanish uh, community of 1821. And um, so we have that going on. We have a, um, uh, the public's invited to contribute to a time capsule. Uh, so nobody needs to send in a mask. We're going to have a mask. So <laughs> you'd be thinking outside the box, uh, so to speak, and uh, think about something that represents um, uh, uh, our 2021 community that will go in the time capsule uh, to commemorate this event. There will be booths that will be set up. There are going to be food trucks. Um, there will be um, just a, a number of reenactments. Uh, we have a kill boat coming down from Ohio, and this would have been what the vegetables flowed down from the upper reaches of the Escambia River and the farms there into Pensacola with their produce. So people will be able to actually visit a working kill boat with its crew. Uh, and that this was a mode of transportation that was, uh, was in use here in Pensacola at that time. Time. And they will also be able to see military reenactors. So during the um, 
programming, formal programming, you will see reenactors. Also throughout, uh, both on Friday and on Saturday, there will be reenactments going on down in the village. You will see people cooking food of the, of the period in the kitchens down there, uh, and you will see demonstrations of games. There will be children's games. Uh, the Fiesta is organizing a uh, historic scavenger hunt. Uh, for history and archaeology. Yeah. So come with your family and participate in learning about the history and archaeology through a uh, scavenger hunt in the village that day. Um, we are doing things that we we want to engage the public in a, in a lot of different different ways. And uh, so uh, that's th those are just a few of the things going on. I personally am wanting everyone to purchase a parasol that day because that's been one of the most charming aspects of one of the businesses in town is that someone was selling parasols. Oh. And uh, so you can have a parasol mm -hmm. for over your head uh, as you stroll through the village and listen to hot. the music. <laughs> it's going to be hot. Um, but um, what we're looking at doing are things that we could actually organize and, and pull off in the midst of a pandemic and look to the future with what we would have for a product. Um, and of course, the documentary, which you all are making, WSRE, uh, will be folding along with the, four, the programs that we are doing here and different spots that will be on WSRE. At the end of this, there will be a documentary that looks at um, the, uh, the year the whole year of 2021 and 1821, so it will be a quite uh, comprehensive product. Uh, and um, that is a product that uh, we're very pleased to be partnering, the commission is, with WSRE on uh, producing. And then, of course, we have the 1821 Sampler, very interactive project, uh, and we uh, have the walking tour of St. Michael's Cemetery uh, that you can look at on your phone or visit the cemetery and track. So uh, a lot of people have been involved in bringing things to the public that we might not have been able to do or even thought about doing if right. we had been in any kind of a regular pre-pandemic mode. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can listen to the lectures uh, on um, from the um, Pensacola Archaeological mm -hmm. Society. Uh, there, there are many things that you can do that will loop you into what was going on in 1821 and what's going to be going on in 2021. And don't forget the flyover. Oh, the flyover. Yes. yes. Oh, there will be a flyover. <laughs> People should come. Uh -huh. <laughs> it will fly right over our heads. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the yeah. flag raising where the Spanish and the flag flag raising comes down we... and the American flag goes up. And, That's uh, true. Part mm -hmm. of the programming mm -hmm. will be uh, uh, the recreation of the raising and lowering of the lowering of the flag and the raising of the American flag. And uh, we have special music uh, that we will be having over the course of the uh, event. Uh, and and um, I will tell you now, having witnessed uh, this, uh, it, it will raise chill bumps uh, and mm. make, you, make you have a real sense of who you are as an American mm -hmm. and where we all come from. Beautiful music. Well, Dr. Benz, when I hear all these things going on, uh, I hear the word that um, all, all are invited. So yes. people that are watching, this isn't like for students or certain people. Nope. This is, is this, I mean, can we fit the whole community down there? Yes, we can mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because we're going to have the whole historic district. And I hope that we need to find extra chairs mm -hmm. uh, for the, for the program. Uh, and you know, one of the things that everybody enjoys about uh, being together are the booths for the different organizations like the West Florida Genealogical Society has done a ton of work. Mm -hmm. They have identified more than 2,000 residents of Pensacola uh, at the transition into the territorial period and, uh, and have data on them, who they were, what they did, where they lived, uh, how many children they had, and so on. And there's this, there's this kind of personal public touch, and that's what we wanted to get at that this is not for his just historians, it's not for archae just archaeologists, it's not for just VIPs. It is really for the community, and the community is going to have a good time. <laughs> and uh, there will be lots of booths and many organizations that haven't put up their booth in a year and a half or two. And uh, I think it's going to be uh, very enjoyable for little kids and for grandma and grandpa and mm -hmm. mom and dad. Uh, it's, it's something, there'll really be something for everybody, and it's absolutely free. Mm -hmm. It sounds huge, and, and I'm just thinking, I'm sure all the restaurants will be open, mm -hmm. but I'm also thinking, 
bring a picnic, get your parasol, mm -hmm. right? right? And yeah, and bring a picnic. Mm -hmm. uh, there will be food there, and of course, the Downtown Improvement Board. Uh, they're, they are uh, wrapping all of the utility boxes out in Garden Street uh, with really beautiful graphics uh, that talk about the, the history of our community. And uh, they will be having the farmer's market that morning, so people could even go early to the farmer's market and mm -hmm. then come on down into the village. This is a, uh, an event that really takes in our whole downtown historic area, and we do want people to come. This has been a year of trial for, for so many people, uh, both in their personal and professional lives, for our restaurants, for our businesses. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to say, come back come back and yes. come see us. And uh, so we are very much uh, looking at this as a way to get our residents out and to bring visitors to our community right. and see the wonderful things we have to offer. Everything is handicap accessible, mm -hmm. all the museums and all the, the park and the booths and things like that. So there's the only thing we're worried about is rain. Oh. And if it rains, we'll be in the uh, Museum of Commerce mm -hmm. across the street. And it's a great big room. Mm -hmm. We'll squeeze them in. Mm -hmm. Well, and if it does rain, it'll just be another part of history because <laughs> you're literally making history with this project, That's I believe. True. Yeah. yeah, it's very different than what they did 50 years ago, and we like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it'll be different 50 years from now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about differences, touch just a little bit on what Pensacola was like pre-flag raising and what it's what it became. What sort of the big differences well, there? Well, I think the big difference is cultural and political. Um, politically, it had been under a king, and still is. Spain has a king uh, and royalty, and it was authoritarian uh, uh, autocracy, which is what you know monarchies are, and uh, and so the that's all these people, all of them, the French, the Spanish, the British, they all were under that form of government. Uh, the, the, so the transition to democracy was, first of all, people didn't speak English and very much. And uh, uh, an interesting thing about the change in government is that they didn't, people in general didn't know what democracy meant. Mm -hmm. You know, and so they, um, the U.S. government and Andrew Jackson said, we're only going to appoint officials for one year. The governor, he was governor for one year, the sheriff, the mayor, the county commission, the judges, all of that one year because in the United States, we elect our leaders. So mm -hmm. we're going to have an election in one year. Mm -hmm. And so during that year, they educated people about voting, mm -hmm. about how government works. They, they gave them, they had them uh, uh, English uh, lessons mm -hmm. to, to speak English. And uh, it was really a conversion of political, but but culturally, it was very mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. uh, the there weren't many Anglo-Saxons. Mm -hmm. uh, there were people from foreign countries, and they had uh, different values. While there were African American slaves, there were also free people, and they were integrated. We would use that word today. The community was integrated, and uh, so there were people that of different ethnicities, but they mixed and mingled with each other. Mm -hmm. That's. Yeah. They, they did. It was, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, it, it was a slower pace mm -hmm. under the Spanish, yeah. much slower pace, but the Americans came in and shook it up. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> shook it up. And uh, so um, everyone uh, pretty much got with the plan uh, over time. So you see, uh, as uh, Judy said, by the time we get maybe, you know, 10 or 15 years into the American period, people are speaking English as a as their as their uh, uh, language of, of choice in doing in their commerce, and uh, they are still speaking their native language in their home and with their friends. But you're seeing a real shift there, and you're also seeing a shift in the food ways. And I think that is a uh, you know food unites us all the way down the line. But you're seeing a lot of different uh, cultural traits that are joined together. People come with what's comfortable for them and what they're used to. And so, religion, you know. And religion. Uh, the, we see the Protestants it. came in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first church was the first Methodist church. Uh, a missionary mm -hmm. came from uh, uh, New Orleans, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't know where, but yeah. uh, came in and established the church, mm -hmm. uh, the first Protestant church. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was very different. It wasn't bad or worse. It was just different. Different. And uh, like uh, we say, you know, 15, 20 years later, it had made the transition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think one of, uh, in, in, on the religious front, one of the most interesting things is the, the church here was the Catholic Church. It was St. Michael's, mm -hmm. the parish of St. Michael's. And when the Americans came in, 
they went to St. Michael's. They might not have understood one thing about what was happening in the service, but that is where they went to church initially. Uh, and then they began to uh, develop small groups of uh, meetings and then, of course, more formal mm -hmm. uh, religion for the Protestant population developed. But the Catholic Church was very welcoming to everyone and they all went. And uh, then afterwards, um, they were amazed at what happened on the Sabbath in Pensacola mm. uh, after everyone attended Mass. So uh, the Spanish were, were welcoming, and uh, mm -hmm. on, on every front we see a welcoming Spanish community, and we see the Americans coming in as well mm -hmm. to, um, to blend these two together. And then they all start marrying each other. <laughs> and right. uh, so we see a really uh, an explosion in the blending of families uh, between yeah. You could describe the, uh, the, the uh, the territorial period mm -hmm. as one of transition mm -hmm. because in 1845 we became a state yeah. the 27th state in the United States we were American we were owned by them we had their form of government but uh, it was sort of in the in the the early stages and uh, by the time 1845 rolls around uh, they're ready to become a state I love what you've been doing in this community, both of you. We, we were, we're going to talk in another segment uh, a little bit more about St. Michael's and a little bit more about the food mm -hmm. and, and some of the different aspects of the, and the people, some of the things we've been talking about. But what's interesting to me is that this whole celebration, this whole time, people will be walking pretty much on hallowed ground. Oh, is yeah. that a fair assessment? It's mm -hmm. one of Pensacola's absolutely most significant resources mm -hmm. uh, are the deposit, the remains of the people in the cemeteries and also all of the material that is buried a foot underground. And uh, Pensacola is low in terms of elevation and they were always bringing in fill dirt, which is marvelous mm -hmm. to protect the archeological deposits. Nobody was more surprised than I at its great preservation. Oh, that's wonderful. We're getting a little bit short on time. I want to make sure that we get everything in this um, segment that we want to say. I know you've got some signage that's going to be, you're just doing mm -hmm. everything just right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we're going to leave behind signs uh, that are both a state historical mm -hmm. marker, official, mm -hmm. went through the process, mm -hmm. uh, and also local signs that we already have some around town. There's a maritime uh, a trail, mm -hmm. and uh, that will focus on important places during the territorial, the second Spanish in the territorial period. Mm -hmm. Yes. And any final thoughts on, on these items we've been discussing? Well, it's uh, for everyone that's worked on this project, it, it has been very fulfilling. And it's been a service to community. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it is for the community. We are so grateful and we're so um, honored to have you come on and we look forward to the documentary and all of the great products that you're doing and all of the work and the history that you're making right now. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you. Oh, for, thank you for yeah, having us, Sherry. Absolutely. Uh -huh. When we come back, Margo will stay with us and we'll bring on some more guests. We'll also learn how the Spanish and American blend led to a new West Florida. You're watching in studio on WSRE TV, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Turn into a monarch butterfly based on the video they said roughly 10 days. PBS Learning Media is a great resource to have because it is highly engaging for the students and it really taps into their love for technology and getting information fast and having it accessible. One of the reasons that we're here today is to work with other teachers and collaborate along with PBS and WSRE and the Gulfarium to bring resources into the classroom for the 21st century. We truly enjoy having teachers and their students visit our park. We appreciate what they do and we love sharing the knowledge that we have um, about marine life and our oceans. PBS Learning Media is a way for me to reach the students through the technology they're plugged in every day. It's just a wealth of resources that I don't think any teacher should not take the opportunity to explore. WSRE Public Television and the Escambia Elementary Principals Association congratulate these Shining Star Award recipients. These students were selected upon the basis of good citizenship and adherence to the core values adopted by the Escambia County School System. Equality, responsibility, integrity, respect, honesty, and patriotism. Congratulations to all of these outstanding students. 
You are watching viewer-supported WSRE-TV, a service of Pensacola State College. Welcome back to In Studio as we continue our discussion about Pensacola's role in the making of Florida. UWF archaeologist Margot Stringfield stays with us and we are now joined by Dr. Brian Rucker, professor of history at Pensacola State College and Deb Mullins who is a historical archaeologist and we are so pleased to have you with us. Um, I'll start with Deb. De tell us a little bit about your background and how you got involved in this. Okay, well I've been doing historical archaeology since the 90s, um, started over in St. Augustine and have worked my way around the Southeast, the Caribbean, Mexico, but with an emphasis on Spanish colonial archeology. span Okay, mm -hmm. and, and, and Dr. Rucker, how about you? Well, I've got, been teaching at PSC for, since the 1990s as well, <laughs> uh -huh. and I also do Florida history and panhandle history at UWF. And are we still calling um, this area the Panhandle? I've heard it go through a lot of different names. We've we've had Northwest Florida, the Panhandle. Whatever you want to call you it. You can call it whatever you want, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, you're just studying the history. Mm -hmm. So let's let's talk a little bit about that. Um, who was here, and and how did things look in in 1821? Okay. Well, I mean, one of the things that's good to to talk about for a moment is what is the second Spanish period and it is a term that we read about in the paper or maybe study in class a little bit here if we grow up here um, and a lot of people don't know what it means. Um, the second Spanish period was the twilight years of the Spanish colonial rule in Florida. British had held, um, the English had held Florida for about two decades the Spanish um, got Florida back. And so those twilight decades leading up to the Americans coming in in 1821 is what the second Spanish period means when we talk about it like that. Um, so Pensacola, of course, was a very small borderland community. There was a specific reason that it came into being in 1698 and stayed um, through hundreds of years, and that was to protect Spain's more prosperous colonies elsewhere. Mm. We're part of a borderland system that they installed early on in the colonial period. Um, but despite that, despite its uh, sort of military foundation, it was a community on its own. It had to be self-sufficient um, because, it, because it was so isolated. And because Spain in Florida was surrounded by her European enemies as well, and also had many issues with Native Americans. Um, they had to learn to negotiate with their European neighbors, with Native Americans, and it was a very diverse, small town in those last decades of Spanish colonial rule. So the first decades, or the first time mm -hmm. of Spanish being here, were they largely different than that second period? Yes, it was very different. Um, during that time period, it was much more strictly a military presidio, it was called. And um, of course, Dr. Judith Benz and other archeologists at UWF have studied those presidios extensively all around Pensacola, out on Santa Rosa Island. Um, but the second Spanish period, although it was military mm -hmm. focused and dominated, um, there were office, a whole officer regiment here and everything, um, it had much more of a civilian feel to it. Okay. So there, that's a main, that is a big difference between that and the first Spanish period. And we're looking mm -hmm. at a map here. What is this, how we looked mm -hmm. at that time? Well, that to me is classic. What? second Spanish period Pensacola looks like when I think of it. Mm -hmm. And that is a map that was drawn by um, Vincent Pintado. He was the Spanish surveyor in that time period. And he spent several years in Pensacola with a team of people um, mapping out West Florida, the city, um, all kinds of tracts of land, whether they be for sale, whether they were inherited through families. So we have hundreds of Pintado maps, but this is the classic um, image of downtown Pensacola. He came through 
and he was actually ordered here to mm -hmm. reorganize the downtown. Mm. So when we look at downtown today, thank you, Pintado. Big, big uh -huh, influence. Because huh? Plaza Ferdinand yeah. and all the, the familiar streets that you know mm -hmm. when you go downtown, mm -hmm. those were formalized in that time period. He mapped it mm -hmm. out. Um, uh, Brian, let's talk a little bit about uh, the role of Native Americans during this um, second Spanish time frame. Uh, very key. The, the Creek Indians in particular, that tribe and in the late 1800s, one of the biggest export items from Pensacola and the West Florida area were deer skins over to England and European countries because industrial revolutions going on there and they need cheap leather for belts and pulleys for all the textile factories. And so they're relying on the white-tailed deer of the Southeast. So you can actually say that England's industrial revolution was powered by the white-tailed deer of the Southeast. Yeah. The Native Americans, the Creeks in particular, in Georgia, Alabama, and Florida, were the ones that hunted the deer, and they brought them to Pensacola and other port cities. Pensacola was a big shipping area. You had the Panton Leslie Trading Company that was working with the Spanish, and they were the big suppliers. Uh, and there was a relationship. They would barter, the Creeks would barter for, uh, for guns, powder, blankets, whatever they needed. But unfortunately, they got into debt and uh, sort of, you know, today we call it Visa Discover MasterCard. And so they were beginning to have to trade some of their lands to get rid of the debts. Now, this, this is what really starts a, a downward spiral for Spain's fortunes in Florida. And because the Creeks, uh, they had a liaison in the early days with the Panton Leslie Company, uh, Alexander McGillivray, who was a uh, half Scottish, half Creek. He watched out for the interests of the Creeks, but he died in the 1790s. And after his death, there's no one really speaking for the interest of the Creek Indians. So they're losing land, they're getting into debt, and they're blaming Spain, they're blaming everyone. And so this is a, a bad situation that's just going to spiral further and further into the early 1800s. Mm. And we're looking at a picture here right now, I guess, a rendering. Alexander McGillivray. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And who was this? He was the liaison between the Pant and Leslie okay. Trading Company and the Creeks. Yes. Because he was half Scottish, half Creek. But his death in the 1790s uh, really triggered a, a series of misfortunes that would just ultimately be the perfect storm for Spain. Mm. And this picture that we're looking at here. That's some of the original Pant and Leslie Trading Company buildings that was in downtown Pensacola, survived up to the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where the people came to do the trading and, and they were shipped off deer skins uh, by shiploads. And where was that located in downtown? Near the first, uh, near the Judicial Center. Okay, okay. So everything was pretty close to the waterfront, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Um, and there is a replica of it. Most people know it as the Doll House oh, downtown. Okay. okay. So, mm -hmm. all right, so we can still look at something mm -hmm. that looks very similar to that. Mm -hmm. When I hear the two of you talking, um, it feels like it was a very tumultuous time. Am I um, getting that correct? Or, or, or were people pretty well entrenched in the community and knew their places and their roles? I think that it was both. Um, I think that always on the geopolitical scale, on a larger scale, it was a period of dramatic change all across the Southeast. Um, but people were living their daily lives here and going about their business and making plans for the future. And I think that as Anglo-Americans, a lot of us are taught the idea of manifest destiny of the United States. But that is not how the people who lived here saw things. They did not think about their fortunes and futures in that way. They were planning for themselves and their families as part of a Spanish colony under the Spanish king. And so there were set roles here. Um, but yes, on a larger scale, major things were happening. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts on that? Uh, definitely. I think the people here in Pensacola, in the town itself, had a sense of security. Mm -hmm. But outside the city limits, it was the wild frontier. There was hardly anyone between here and uh, Tallahassee, St. Mark's. Uh, you've got the Americans on the border. You've got the, the Creeks on the border. It, it was a borderland struggle. And uh, 
You've got all, all these people pl trying to play pawns off of each other. You've got the British involved. You've got the Spanish involved. You've got the Americans involved. You've got the Creeks involved. All these little power struggles are going on in the late 1700s and early 1800s. Wow, and then, so now, who were the first non-Spanish inhabitants coming into West Florida? You may have already covered that, but I wanna make sure we let people know about well, that. Well, Deb would say that this goes back to the first Spanish period because, mm -hmm. or the second Spanish period beginnings, you've got all cosmopolitan people. You got people from the Caribbean, you got French, you've got, it's a port city. You're gonna have a lot of different mm -hmm. Uh, people from other countries. So Pensacola's always been cosmopolitan from the colonial period to the day. And the first people really coming down about the early 1800s are a lot of Scotch-Irish from the Alabama uh, area from Georgia. Some of them were running away from uh, uh, indentured, and they were indentured servants trying to uh, find a better life. They were going into the Spanish Florida. They were basically squatters. and. They lived up um, on the north of Scambia River on both sides of Santa Rosa and Scambia counties today. Uh, they're sort of quietly farming, living out little lives. And the Spanish knew they were there but didn't really complain because they knew they could be shipping down potatoes and corn and stuff to the people in Pensacola, which prevented them having to go to Havana for everything they needed. So that was supplying them with food to the people, the Hispanic population in Pensacola. So it was like, okay, we know you're up there illegally, <laughs> but we appreciate what you're doing. <laughs> We're, you're well, helping and one us of the out. things that changed in this time period was Spain's approach to interlopers, mm -hmm. as you, if you call them, mm -hmm. <laughs> because before they wouldn't have tolerated it, but they had no choice now because they were surrounded on all sides by European enemies and now America. Mm. And um, trying to understand what is this America? <laughs> you know, what does that mean? So they chose instead um, to take the route that Brian is describing. And they would have sent priests among them. Um, they wanted them to uh, swear fealty to the king. They wanted them to convert to Catholicism. But they took a different approach to it. They weren't trying to run them out. They needed the stability. They needed the goods that they could bring in, especially through agriculture adventures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But by this time period, too, it is important to, to remember that there was, you know, already two and three generations just in this short time period of Spaniards, French Creoles, um, Spanish Creoles, free um, black people who were residents here and black Creoles here as well. And they all had businesses and investments in the community and they wanted it to succeed. Mm -hmm. And do those influences carry over into, uh, from 1821 into 2021? I'll, I'll, I'd like for both of you mm -hmm. to answer that question. Mm -hmm. They definitely did. Because many of the Creole families, aside from a lot of the black Creoles, um, chose to stay when Florida became a U.S. territory because they were so invested. And as Brian mentioned previously, security is local. And they were secure here with their families and their community. They felt like they could take a chance. So they decided to stay. Um, but things did start shifting, as has been alluded to. Um, you know, the dominant form of government shifted. Um, the dominant form of religion started to shift, not within those families necessarily, but you know, they had to get along. Mm -hmm. And yep. you can see this reflected. It's quite interesting when you go through the historical documents, the, our newspapers. You know, our first new, newspaper here started right away in 1821. So we have really great records showing, um, you know, there was, there was a balance. There were still, you know, the more wealthy families were advertising in for tutors to, to teach French and Spanish to their children. They wanted to keep their traditions alive um, for different culinary um, lessons and musical lessons and things like that, but they were adapting at the same time. 
And you were talking about some of the different families. We just had a picture pulled up. Now, w what are we looking at here? Well, I mean, when we talk about the late Spanish colonial period, um, there's some families that people in Pensacola recognize their family names. This is a part of the Gonzalez family. Um, this is Pauline Gonzalez, and she was actually the daughter-in-law of Manuel Gonzalez, who was the first Gonzalez in the, the territory. Um, this was the wife of his first son, Celestino, and he died quite young, but she lived into her 90s. They're both buried together in St. Michael's Cemetery, as Margo can attest. And um, I've been studying this family in particular for a long time, and I feel like we are cousins, sort of. <laughs> and um, You so, get to know people. Yeah, whenever mm -hmm. I meet a Gonzalez around town, it makes mm -hmm. me happy. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so a lot of the De La Ruas, mm -hmm. the Bonifaz, mm -hmm. the Gonzalez, a lot of those families still here and have a proud heritage. Mm -hmm. Very proud. My grandfather, Dr. Maxwell de la Rua, mm -hmm. he, um, he was very fond of talking about the family's history and he was very, very proud of mm -hmm. that. And it does date back, as, as you well know, back mm -hmm. to Francisco coming, I guess, in the late 1700s. I believe he's buried in New Orleans, so we had a quite a lot to do with New Orleans during those time right. periods. Well, the woman that was just shown, Pauline mm -hmm. Gonzalez, she was actually from New Orleans. Um, her father was a native of Spain. He came here and married a Creole in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And um, there was much goings on back and forth between <laughs> Pensacola and New Orleans. And when I talk about Pensacola culture, I mean Gulf Coast culture. Right. And that include, we are included in the sphere, the orbit of New Orleans a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those um, cultural traditions are still here and it's very different from even the rest of Florida, which is what makes Pensacola and the Panhandle so interesting. We love that me. you're here. Um, we were talking about the differences of the people and we're gonna go through some more pictures too in just a moment, but uh, the differences that, or the, the way things have, have stayed similar to 1821 and, and 2021 with the people. There's still connections, you know, in that territorial period, you still have enormous amounts of trade going on, shipping between Pensacola and uh, New Orleans, Mobile, Pascagoula, uh, Galveston. Uh, it's just amazing to see uh, the interconnections in the territorial period. It just, you know, that's what we built on for the next 200 years. Yeah, let's pull up some of those more, some more of those pictures, if you don't mind, Ted, and, and we'll have uh, Deb walk us through some of the images uh, that she provided for us, if we mm -hmm. could do that. Um, you, where do you get all your images? Here, here's one. Um, well, um, this I wanted to show because if I'm talking about Creoles, especially the black Creole community mm -hmm. here, I, I like to include her because she actually is an early author on, she's a Creole from Pensacola, her family's from here. And um, her, work, her work was largely overlooked for a long time, but it was recently republished and has been being built on by other scholars in the area. Mm -hmm. So she is one of the first to write a master's thesis on what is the Creole community here in Pensacola. So Very I like to pretty. include her. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm talking about Creoles, I mean, just like one of the projects related to the anniversary celebrations of pairing people's photos who are citizens of Pensacola now with a biographical portrait of someone who lived here in the colonial or early American period, I like to always always try to find images to show what they looked like because they had a different look. Uh, the Creoles in Pensacola were a mix of French, Spanish, African, Native American, and they did not look like me. They mm. did not look like Anglo, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. so they, uh, the photos and portraits are hard to come by, especially for, for men. Mm. Um, there's very, they're, they're hard to access, there was fewer mm -hmm. of them painted. But um, these are from a private collection in New Orleans of miniatures and they were actually, one of them was actually painted by an artist who was a free black uh, Creole in New Orleans, so it makes it special. Um, and the art has sort of, it's starting to get unearthed. Mm. And so it has become a valuable focus for collectors and that gives us access through their online publications, auctions, and then of course our wonderful archives here mm. that we have. And I'm always looking because it's important to look at their faces and recognize who they are. 
so people, I imagine, could find you somewhere on on the web and, and get information to mm -hmm. you if they have mm -hmm. information on that as well. Brian, if you were telling somebody that um, didn't know anything about Pensacola, Pensacola's history and this great celebration that we have um, in 2021, where are the places you would tell them to be sure to look in Pensacola to find the most rich uh, history um, information? Well, the West Florida collection, the basement of the John C. Pace Library at UWF, is the largest depository of West Florida information bar none. And so we've got a wonderful, wonderful resource right here locally. It's great, great material. Mm -hmm. And then obviously St. Michael Cemetery. There's a good bit of information available there. Um, fortunately, there was a survey that was done in the 1930s, a, a vocational survey, uh, and it's been a great help to us in identifying what has been lost and also in helping to read degraded sites. And then, of course, we have a geographic information system for the cemetery. And this is tied into all of the archaeology work we do in the downtown area. And uh, so you're able to navigate uh, online in, in a pretty effective manner with what's going on. And now that we can get out and about, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can go on an archaeological walking tour of downtown Pensacola. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what you'll be looking at is the landscape that was standing in the second Spanish period. And there are still several buildings, you know, original homes, things like that. There's recreations, including one of the most important social spots of the time period, the Tivoli House, which is actually based on a um, Tivoli House in New Orleans. And it was a gathering place, it was a dance hall, it was used as a theater. They had opera there, all kinds of plays. and you know, Pensacola was very cultured compared to what you were going to get almost anywhere else around. And in the second Spanish period, theater companies would come through here and spend several months rehearsing um, plays and doing runs of plays before they went on to New Orleans. Or the sort of B-team actors would come over here to get more experience. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. It was always a packed house. And there's a story, you know, that the, um, the first theater started in Pensacola and was named the Jacksonian Theater, but that is simply not true. They oh. just renamed it for him for a little while yes. and then went back. <laughs> and there was theater here throughout uh -huh. Uh -huh. the late colonial period. Um, they loved a, a good tune. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there were many bands. Mm -hmm. There were many social clubs and bars. Um, many of them were run by women, uh, small business owners um, of all stripes and backgrounds mm -hmm. were women in the late colonial period. So the more you dig, literally, and in historical documents, <laughs> mm -hmm. the more addictive it is because there's so many stories to tell. Wow, mm -hmm. and you know, and Pensacola still loves its theater and mm -hmm. culture and um, music. When you think about a town of this size mm -hmm. that has our own ballet company, our own opera theater, mm -hmm. that that's our roots. Mm -hmm. Those are our roots, mm -hmm. and they have stayed alive. They were founded in, in the late colonial period, mm -hmm. and they have stayed with us. Uh -huh. It's important. Another map here. Yeah, that's another Pintado beautiful creation, mm -hmm. and I like it because it just shows the greater area around Pensacola. And um, I know that Brian has gone through a lot of these maps extensively because it's neat looking at them because it really is an insight into a lot of the different economy activities. Brian, what do you teach your students about that? I love maps. I think maps are highly <laughs> underrated. They're so filled with too. wonderful historical <laughs> things. And, and so many people, I don't know how to read a map. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I got GPS, but uh, mm -hmm. we learned so much. Yeah. And, and you know, what's amazing is there's so many new, old historical artifacts still coming to light. Mm -hmm. Just when we thought like we'd seen it all, here comes a, a, a treasure trove of materials that somebody had in an attic and suddenly mm -hmm. it's available to us. And I think that's only going to continue because there is a resurgence of interest in Creole identity in the United States. There's many different forms of Creole identity. And so some of the families that maybe buried it for a long time because it was not advantageous to their family, especially in the American territory period, it started tightening down on black Creoles. And that history was buried within families for a long time, but it's starting to come out again. And um, it's gonna be fascinating to see what the next few decades of research brings out. A resurgence of pride, if mm -hmm. you will, it sounds like. I do not think the families ever lost pride. Mm -hmm. I think that they had to 
keep it quiet and keep mm -hmm. it within their own communities because there was a lot of stigma attached to it. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, you know, it's a shame. And you can start seeing it right away, even in, in simple things like the directories in Pensacola. Um, there were, um, around in the early 1820s, if you were Creole, you were listed in the white section and there would be a separate notation for Creole. Well, by the late 1820s, if you were Creole, it was um, listed in the black section and then it was listed as Creole. Mm. And so there was a lot of controversy and people had to decide and were forced to decide what track they were gonna take. Um, and so, yes, a lot of family histories got buried because it was not advantageous to their families and their interests. And people will always choose to protect their families when they need to. Sure, and a resurgence mm -hmm. of And I hope so, sharing. I hope more and yeah. more of it sharing. comes out. And, and talking about things that come out, we've, we've got a photo of some artifacts um, that mm -hmm. uh, we- I wanted to just yeah. throw up some photos. Uh -huh. um, a lot of these are very much relevant to mm -hmm. some of the things we've been talking about mm -hmm. because you know, um, it wasn't just all business. Mm -hmm. And like we touched on with the theater and arts that were so important, you know, like I said, there were many bars here. In mm -hmm. fact, Rachel Jackson in her short stay mm -hmm. in Pensacola did nonstop complaining about all the parties and dancing <laughs> mm -hmm. and good times. I've heard about that. <laughs> so now, these are the types of artifacts we might dig up downtown. Mm -hmm. And the another interesting um, ephemera that will I hope will start to appear for Pensacola. Um, these sorts of sorts of flyers would have been on the walls in bars, and it was sort of like a way for popular music to travel from community to community. And they would have all kinds of songs, mm -hmm. ballads, funny songs, political in nature, things like that. So just touching on some of the historical and archaeological um, products. This is actually a Creole band. Um, that was in Pensacola, and it's from the 1870s. Um, and they were widely popular for many years. Like I said, um, the Creole community didn't go anywhere. Wonderful to have mm -hmm. these images, and um, this is? Um, I want to touch on that because I, th it, I think it's important. It, it dates to um, 1846, and it's actually your one of your ancestors is oh. listed on the petition. Nice. As well as the families mm -hmm. I, I mentioned before, the Bonifaces, mm -hmm. the Gonzales. This is actually a petition by the white citizens of Pensacola to the Florida government in Tallahassee asking for the special taxes that have been levied against Pensacolians of color, in mm -hmm. particular black mm -hmm. Creoles and mm -hmm. free black people, to have their taxes reduced to the same rate as the white residents of Pensacola. They were not happy that their neighbors and friends and family members were being persecuted, and they did try to make moves to protect each other in wonderful the community. Wonderful to know, that's wonderful mm -hmm. to know. And you mentioned these other, I have people come over to me all the time and tell me that I'm their cousin, and they mm -hmm. have names, the, the Bonifaces and Sierras, and um, it's just, it's Pens being in Pensacola mm -hmm. is, a, is a special treat. But we talked about how this big celebration is not just for people that have been here for a long time. It's, it's really for everybody, and we're getting short on time. It is for everyone, and um, I think um, this is uh, raising awareness of just how mm -hmm. we are all connected. We're all standing next together, mm -hmm. next to each other. We are friends, we're neighbors, and um, it's, it's a wonderful way to bring our community together. Fortunate that we have you all in our midst, and we appreciate everything that you're doing, and we look forward to learning more. Thank you for being with us. Thank, Thank you. you for having Thank us. you so much. Also, special thanks to our earlier guest, uh, Dr. Judy Bentz. Uh, we've just had a fascinating, fascinating conversation here about all the different Northwest Florida um, aspects and the roles that we played, um, the crucial role in the making of our state. Uh, this program will be available soon online at WSRE.org as well as on YouTube and we hope that you will share it around with your friends and your family. I'm Sherry Hemminghouse Weeks. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you again soon.